Thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Janice Kuhn. I'm a senior lecturer at, at the School of Drama, the Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts. Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, second virtual live streaming talk, Event Thai Conversation Series. Before we start, I uh, would like to bring you at for attention to a few house rules. And uh, first thing is that this talk will last for around uh, 75 minutes, uh, expected to complete by 6.45 Hong Kong time or 8.45 Melbourne time. Uh, during the talk, only the moderator and the speakers are allowed it to use the video, audio, and screen sharing function. If participants would like to ask questions, please leave it to, through the chat box. Uh, we will pick the relevant questions and may answer them in a Q&A session at the end of the conversation. The organizer will record the talk and reserves the right to use the recordings ticket. So this session is being captioned by Louis, uh, Louis and Ray. If you'd like to uh, have captioning to be visible to you, please click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your window. This conversation series is supported by the National Foundation for Australia-China Relations. This series focuses on the impacts of COVID-19 and strategies to think through the crisis. For our second talk, we are very happy to have Joseph, uh, Sophie and Josephine to share with us their insights of today's topic, New Models, International Residencies. May I now introduce uh, our two speakers today, uh, Ms. Sophie, uh, Tra Sophie Travers, board member of Res Artists Australia and director of Collingwood Yards. Welcome, Sophie. Thank you. Hello. And our second speaker today is Ms. Josephine White, director, Asian C uh, Cultural Council, Hong Kong. Welcome, Josephine. Yes. Uh, for our um, a special guest today, uh, Today, I have tied up my bun, uh, my hair as in a bun, and I'm wearing a dark blue shirt. Yeah, that, that's what I'm wearing today. And uh, we, we would like to invite uh, Sophie to uh, start the conversation by introducing a little bit uh, about Res Artists Australia. Sophie, please. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, good evening from Melbourne. Uh, as is traditional for Australians, I would like to introduce the land on which I'm speaking to you from, and that is the land of the Wurundjeri Nation, uh, of the Eastern Kulin Nation here in Victoria, in the city now known as Melbourne, uh, also known as Narn. And I pay my respects to their elders, to any First Nations people that are here with us this evening and to acknowledge that the land here in Australia was never ceded. Um, it's always going to be and always was Aboriginal land. Um, so I'm a white uh, middle-aged lady uh, with uh, sandy brown hair. Uh, I'm in my home, it's evening, it's dark. I'm sitting against a backdrop of plants and a painting. And um, I'm wearing a pink jacket and uh, dangly earrings. And um, I put on lipstick after my dinner just to try and be professional and wake myself up. <laughs> it's been a long day. So thank you everybody for being here. Um, as so beautifully introduced, I'm on the board of Res Artists. And uh, this is a network, it's the only network that exists principally to service artist residencies around the world. It's a well-established network. It's been going for 27 years and uh, we have over 550 uh, members in the network. The network is, um, comprises of residency centers in over 55 countries. And it really varies from country to country how many members there are and what the nature of those residencies are. Some of them are very, very small. Some of them are really quite large. Some of them are well established. Some are very new. Some are artist led. Some are run by governments. Some are bodies like the funding body here in Australia, the Australia Council for the Arts is a member because they have a responsibility for sending artists to residencies. And we would have in other countries, similar professional bodies that either support residencies or advocate 
or run operations on behalf of groups of residencies. So it's a very diverse membership, but what it all has in common is an interest in supporting artist residencies. The network offers services to members um, that is a lot to do with that support, which is um, offering best practice information. So if you visit our website, you'll see a lot of resources that are available to residency operators and to artists. And we really try to cover that, um, that group in conversations that are shared or conversations specifically for each. We try to offer uh, tools to achieve funding support for your residency with your government. Joining the network is sometimes very useful in that it gives you a certain status and a certain um, sort of uh, sustainability in your government's eyes that enables you to apply for support. We keep a very low membership fee for, for individuals so that it, it's not difficult to join. Um, and that really encourages people then to have access to open calls where residencies are advertised. We have a, a Facebook group and we do quite active networking. We have a few projects, uh, not so many as other networks perhaps because we're a very tiny team uh, and uh, a voluntary board. But the projects, the kind of projects we do are things like uh, exchanges between residency operators where they might work in each other's organizations. And then uh, we also facilitate conferences and gatherings. And so there are two of those coming up uh, quite soon. Um, and in association with those, we also post uh, uh, recordings or artifacts from pre uh, residencies and conferences run by our members. So the website is our, our main tool for communication and it's very rich. Uh, it's really worth a look. I'd, I'd recommend to anybody interested in this field, you can very easily access a lot of the website without being a member. And then by joining, you get that second deep dive into our resources. Might do for now. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Uh, we can we can hear that uh, Res uh, Artists Australia is a really big uh, national, you know, scale of a residency network. And uh, our second speaker today, uh, Josephine Wai, who's re representing Asia uh, Asian Cultural Council of Hong Kong, uh, is more uh, like a regional, uh, uh, local uh, office that uh, provide uh, artist residency, or they put it as an uh, artist uh, exchange projects that supports artist research. So may I invite Josephine to introduce a, li a little bit about ACC Hong Kong, please. Uh, thank you, Janice. Uh, first of all, um, uh, uh, I am, uh, you can tell that I am uh, Chinese. I have uh, dark brown hair, brown eyes. I'm wearing eyeglasses today, and I'm wearing a white shirt with a black cardigan and a pearl earring to me. To, make, to project a more professional image today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, the organization that I am working for is Asian Cultural Council. And it is uh, uh, founded by J.D. Rockefeller in New York in 1963. And we'll be celebrating our 60th anniversary very soon in two years time. And uh, what we are about is we, we run cultural exchange programs. We support artists, uh, uh, Asian artists traveling to the United States and vice versa. And the reason why we're doing this is we find that artists are really good connectors and bridge builders. And through uh, supporting artists, we like to promote, to be able to promote international respect and understanding and more international dialogue among people from different cultures and background. And at the same time, uh, cultural exchange, that, that experience of being able to live in another, another culture is a great nourishment for creative talents. And this is what we have been doing for the past 60 years. And uh, our head office is in New York, and we have four regional offices in Tokyo, Manila, Taipei, and Hong Kong. And I am actually working in Hong Kong office. And we have been around in Hong Kong for more than 30 years. 
And um, to introduce our fellowship programs, um, I'd like to uh, tell us very short stories about one of our fellow, and that might illustrate what we do at the ACC. And I know a half, at least half of the audience is from Hong Kong and another half of Australia. And if I may, I'd like to uh, 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 tell you a story about a choreographer and dance artist, Wu Chuck Yin, that we all know in Hong Kong. And she is one of our most prolific uh, 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 choreographer, uh, 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 um, female artists. And uh, we, in Hong Kong, we all know that uh, 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 Mui, we call them Xiu Mui. Xiu Mui trained in Chinese dance when she was really young. And uh, she danced for the Hong Kong uh, Dance Company. And when she joined the Hong Kong Dance Company, at that time, Jiang, Jiang Qing was the artistic director. And Jiang Qing is already a very cross-cultural person. She was from mainland China, that she was exposed to United States, and she combined very successfully elements between Chinese dance and the Western concept into her choreography. And the young Silmo at that time was amazed with this personality, how she successfully combined East and West uh, uh, together. And then, uh, uh, and so she started a career dancing Chinese dance. And then uh, 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 the opportunity came when she went to New York for the first time. And it was an eye opener for her. And she said that uh, it was in the 1980s. And the, one of the evenings, she went to a solo performance by a Japanese dancer. And she saw that performance dancing solo for the whole time. This was the first time that she saw a person dancing solo. Mm -hmm. And her question was, why not? Wouldn't it be fabulous if I could dance solo for the whole evening instead of in an ensemble? And then she returned back to Hong Kong with that idea in her mind. And then, for, and then uh, uh, the second opportunity comes, came when she received a grant from the ACC where she returned to New York for the second time. And, uh, and at first, and during that time, she got a grant for six months, for six months. And what she did was, uh, she went to see every performances available in New York, a uh, 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 performance at Lincoln Center or very small performance in a basement with only a small signage at the street. She would go there and see it in the middle of the night, 2 a.m. Uh, at that time. And um, it was a really eye opener for her because that's how when she uh, uh, started to realize that um, the concept of contemporary dance. She, um, she started to discover that, oh, dance is actually about discovering and in inventing. And, uh, and uh, it's more about discovering yourself and look at things from another perspective, more importantly, from your own perspective. And, and then the other time was uh, she spent a lot of time in the Lincoln Center Library of Performing Arts, where she would watch all the videos of the dance legend, learning about the artistic language, the concept. And it was really inspirational for her. And when she came back to Hong Kong, she, uh, 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 she made the work Awakening in the Dance, Yao Yun Ging Mo. If we are a Hong Kong audience, we know that this is a signature piece, not only for Siu Mui, but also for Hong Kong contemporary dance. And, uh, I have a second part to see more story, but I don't know about the time. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether you're interested to, to hear her returning back to New York for the second time, where she learned about contact improvisation. Mm -hmm. And that's where she got this, her second transformation mm -hmm. change, mm -hmm. transformational change. Mm -hmm. But I guess in a matter of time, I will stop now. But I, what I want to illustrate with the Simon story was that uh, for ACC, actually, we don't define ourselves as an artist residence. We are actually more about cultural exchange. Mm -hmm. We don't operate a physical location. And what we were able to provide to our grantee is an extended lived experience in another culture mm -hmm. where they, to give them time and space, to discover themselves, to give them an eye-opening experience. And it is more about the experience and the process 
rather than asking them to produce a work to have it deliverable, deliverable. And I guess this is a, a, a description of the ACC program in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Josephine. Very, very inspiring uh, stories. Uh, well, by the way, I'm one of the branches of uh, ACC as well. And I went to New York uh, to conduct my research in dramaturgy uh, like almost like, more than 10 years ago. And so, you know, all, all these, um, I mean, uh, we, we always call that uh, ACC family, like all the artists that support, that has been supported by uh, ACC. Uh, we gather together, uh, you know, from time to time, and then we exchange and share our experience back then and, and what we have been changed, you know, after those uh, experiences. Although Josephine, uh, uh, you know, insists that ACC is not the residency uh, organization or program, but for us artists, all the experiences that we live abroad, uh, we research, either we research or we create work with artists abroad. These are valuable experiences for us, uh, no matter how you name it. And, and I, I believe that for Sophie as well, you, you know, you're, you're the board member of that you know, big uh, network of organization. And, I, and will there be any uh, you know, uh, stories that you've heard or you've encountered personally uh, with artists and uh, how they experience in do all those uh, diversified uh, uh, programs, uh, models that uh, you have mentioned? So please. Well, so many uh, stories. Yes, I, I believe there will be like a huge amount of stories that you can tell. Yeah. Yes, I think sometimes the ones that are the quietest are the most interesting, not the ones that uh, are the most obvious. So certainly yes. residencies that I have worked on uh, where an artist has made a connection to a community that has really deeply affected them and yes. has led to friendships and connections yes. that turn into lifelong connections. Those are the ones that I always return to when I think about the difference that residencies can make. I was involved in a, a project linking dance artists in Australia and Finland. And uh, it was a collaborative group of Finnish artists that put together their end of the residency and uh, some Australian artists who were not necessarily working in institutions but were located in the regions in here in Australia who, who joined. And mm -hmm. they discovered some very unexpected connections between those very different places, but they really found each other. And certainly I know that one pair that connected in that time, almost a decade later remain in contact and exchange not really in person because that is so hard. The distances for us are so enormous. And for independent artists in particular, it's very hard to sustain an international practice. And that really, again, is the, the beauty of a residency. You can make a very deep, very strong, very long lasting connection that can mm -hmm. persist for, for decades, even if you cannot afford to travel or you do not have the resources to bring people back to you. Um, and I think those are, the, those are the really positive sides of residencies when somebody really finds something that can sustain uh, an artistic international conversation that doesn't need to be cocked up constantly with money and travel and institutional impetus. Yeah. Mm, that's true that's true yeah uh talking about uh the, like different models of residency like uh, what sophie has just mentioned when we talk about residency we, we always think about traveling like uh we i travel say for example we travel to another country uh to an international uh, uh community uh like uh but uh under you know um uh, last year's pandemic uh, influence uh, we're we're all like caught up in our local you know, community and even, you know, in our own home. Uh, maybe the two of us can share a little bit about uh, different models of residency that cur that's currently going on or in the past, you know, uh, conducted by artists or conducted by different organizations in the network, say, uh, under the rest artists. Can you uh, share with us some models that uh, our as, uh, uh, audience can uh, take reference to, please? Yeah. Either of you can speak uh, when you're ready. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, re responding to uh, uh, Genesis' question, yes, uh, uh, COVID-19 um, did uh, 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 affect how we run residency program because it was not possible for us to travel for the last two years. And, uh, and uh, but then when, 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 when I uh, 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 look back, it is, it is even more, uh, what we're doing is even more relevant than before because due to the pandemic and also the, uh, uh, some of the latest changes that we are facing, uh, uh, we found that uh, uh, we are facing a world that is even more fragmented that uh, 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 there are so many forces pulling us apart. And we really do need programs that would bring us together. And I think residency is one of the means, like Sophie said, that the connection, the relationship that's what's, that were built when you were away from home actually carries beyond your residency period. And during the last two years, when we weren't able to send grantees over to the United States or no artists were able to come over to Asia, we were still able to maintain uh, the relationship, the dialogue, and we were able to run virtual programs because of the relationship that we have built before the pandemic period. And uh, I think the pandemic is a wake up call, is a lesson for us. When we're, uh, when we're entering in the, into the post-pandemic stage, we have to continue what we have been doing Yeah, in the past to prepare us for the future. Yeah, we don't know when there's another major global crisis or challenge. And uh, we need to build more connections which, with uh, people from other, other places so that uh, we will be able to sustain, maintain the international dialogue and relationship. Yeah. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, Sophie, would you like to share about the models of residency in your, in your country? Yes, uh, I certainly agree that um, there's a lot being done to ensure that international connection doesn't simply go away without the travel. Um, the obvious place that people are looking is the digital, like we are meeting here. Um, it's not as good. I would love to be in a room with uh, the other speakers, but it is, it, it is a form of, of staying in touch. And there are many residencies that have uh, chosen to translate their programs into a digital format. And I think it's proving quite interesting in the ways that it is opening the field. Uh, certainly here in Australia, we have places that are quite inaccessible to um, the majority of our population who tend to live on the edges of our continent, our enormous continent. Um, we have some extraordinary art centers, um, particularly the ones run by Aboriginal groups in places that are difficult to reach, just because of the distance, but also the transport connections are not good. And so we've been very interested to look at digital residencies led by some of these art centers. Um, they're not really open to the world as yet. I think it's more in an experimental phase because we have to understand what, um, what that can mean. But uh, res artists were in particular engaged with uh, a residency led by an artist working with a remote Aboriginal art center and trying to, um, trying to interrogate actually the understanding of hosting and what does that mean um, to host an artist and can that be done digitally and can that be done in a place where you have no cultural, existing cultural connection, but the host that welcomes you can give you that context. And is that possible to do remotely? So there's some really great work being done about what, what the digital can offer, um, what is positive, what um, is suddenly available. And I think that also applies to people who find it hard to travel. So artists who live with a disability, um, who uh, often find uh, traveling away from home for long periods or over long distances, 
are suddenly um, given access to, uh, to the digital realm on a more equitable footing. Um, similarly, people with young families or people with other caring responsibilities, uh, their parents or aging relatives or people with chronic illness. There's a whole range of people that have usually been excluded from some of the opportunities that able-bodied privileged people like myself can enjoy. And so I think there is something very interesting happening here around access. And certainly the network is very interested in this and we're, we're trying to capture this and, and document it and share it. Mm, 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 mm. That sounds very amazing because, like, as not I, I believe that only during the pandemic, but uh, in the future, there will be more and more this kind of digital residencies that are going on around the world because of the possibility and the technology development that we can expect more, you know, different kinds of residencies going on. And I think that comes to the um, like the meaning or the essence of residency, like uh, no matter what kind of platform we conduct the residency, but what is the essence of residency and uh, for not only for the artists, but for the organization who present them and uh, all the partners that's involved in the residency. And would you to uh, have uh, some insights uh, on that uh, about what residencies mean to you and what do you think about the future of residency? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, let, let me go fast. Um, uh, I guess uh, basically, basically, uh, uh, we can we can see uh, uh, two types of residents: one with a physical location, and one without, like the ACC. And if I may, I would like to tell you another story about another ACC grant in New York, and that might uh, sort of uh, give us some food, food for thoughts on how we uh, look at residency. Uh, the second story is about a Chinese visual artist. The name is Li Mu. And, um, and uh, he received a grant from ACC uh, in 2012 and uh, spending six months in New York. And for Li Mu, because he is a visual artist. And so we have also uh, uh, arranged for him a, uh, a, a studio as ISCP in Brooklyn, which I guess everybody heard uh, knew about this residency program mm. uh, in New York. And uh, in, in uh, uh, Li Mu's uh, uh, reflection on the six month, he said that he was, uh, he was, he is, he is a very diligent artist and uh, he was very grateful to, uh, 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 to have the opportunity to have, I, to have a studio in ISCP where he knew that the studio is very expensive. So when he uh, arrived in New York, he tried to uh, 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 go to his studio every day, which is uh, a room for him to create artwork. But he was, say, he was saying that this, that was a struggle for him because he, he didn't know whether he should spend time in the studio or to go out to explore New York. It was uh, a constant struggle for him for a few months. And uh, at the end of the day, he said he did not produced the work. He did not produce a lot of work. He only <laughs> produced two pieces of work. And, um, and what he did, in fact, was he went to Chinatown. Sure. As a Chinese, Chinatown, we always have a complex feeling towards Chinatown. Yeah. It, and he said that he found that this so, it's such a filthy place as compared to other places in New York. <laughs> and so what he decided to do was he bought a broom and he went to sweep the streets in Chinatown for seven days. He swept 36 streets mm -hmm. around the Chinatown area. Yeah. He found it really important to him. This, this experience, he found it really important to him. And then he said that uh, uh, at the end of this trip, he said that I did not acquire any new skills through the residency program. But then I understood that as an artist, it's not about making work. As an artist, your attitude towards life is even more important. And that gave him a, a very important idea on how he would continue his artistic career. Mm -hmm. 
I also have a second part of the story. <laughs> what happened to Li Mu after he returned to China? But uh, in a matter of time, I, I, will, I will tell the second part if we have time left for the conversation. <laughs> Sophie, would you like to hear the second part of uh, Li Mu's story? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Please. Okay, please. sure. Okay, uh, <laughs> let, let, let me browse my notes. Um, Li Mu, uh, Li Mu is uh, the hometown is in the place called Qiu Zhuang. It's a small village between Hangzhou and uh, Beijing. When he returned to China, he, 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 and he came from Shanghai when he went to New York. He didn't go back to the big city. He went back to his hometown, where he left his hometown when he, in his uh, uh, formative year. And, uh, and then he found that, oh, there was a, uh, a gap. Uh, this was dis he was distancing from his parents from his uh, village, from his relative. So he decided to go back to Chiu Zhuang. And uh, he said, uh, at first he, it, it, it was not an easy time because he was always trying to explain to his parents what he was doing as an artist. Mm -hmm. His relative, his family did not understand what he's doing. And he did not understand what his, why his, his family did not understand what he's doing. <laughs> Every time mm -hmm. his family was asked, actually, what, what, what did you learn to, 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 what did you do to earn a living? I am a successful artist. When he moved, knew that he was not near anywhere near success, but then, uh, 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 and then he decided. He decided at that time he had a relationship with a, a museum in Netherlands. He decided to do something for his hometown, and he got the permission of the uh, 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 museum in Netherlands to re reproduce ten artwork in the collection. And that ten artwork include works from people like uh, Andy Warhol, Marina Abramovic, and he would, and then he mobilized his local village people to reproduce the artwork in uh, 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 an individual's home, in public spaces, and one outside the village, in the village, and he worked on this project for thirteen months, and at the end of the day he was able to make the connection with his own village. He became good friends. He, he, oh, he, uh, his parents started to understand what he was doing. His relative knew that what art was it about. He made friends with his uh, primary school teacher, secondary uh, school classmate, and the boss of the grocery store in the hometown. And I think this really uh, illustrates what arts and artists are about, and echoing what Sophie was saying that the actually the most successful residency program is not the big mm -hmm. uh, that create more noise, it's the quiet story, and and also the experience to connect the local community. That's the most beautiful stories that we we come across in running residency programs. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Josephine, for the beautiful story. Thank you so much. And Sophie, would you like to share uh, on the, uh, like what you achieve in residency or, or do you have uh, like stories that you would like to share with us? When I was listening to Josephine, I was just thinking about um, the small and the, and the, the big um, and the, the city and the, the different kinds of places where residencies are. Before uh, coming back to Australia, I was living in Berlin and um, are, there are a lot of artist residencies in that city. And maybe if I talk about two at either end of this scale story, um, could be interesting. I think of one that we sent Australian artists to, which was called the Kunstlerhaus Spitanien, which is a very big complex, only looking at artist residencies. So that they, they had um, probably more than a hundred residencies in that complex with a very beautiful gallery in Kreuzberg, a very uh, important district for visiting galleries. So they were on their gallery was in all the circuits. So it was a very prestigious place to arrive. And the Prohibitia, the Goethe Institute, the Canada Council, the Australia Council, the British Council, etc., all had a studio, and every year they would send an artist with a very nice stipend and they would have access to the gallery. So it's a very Rolls-Royce experience. And the artists really 
support. What was very beautiful about that complex was that artists had a community amongst themselves. So our Australian artist studio was located next to a Korean uh, council studio and next to a Canada council studio. And naturally on their way to the toilet or their way out the door, they would always connect and become neighbors and friends. And they would find the Icelandic studio or the, the Japanese uh, foundation. And so there was a really beautiful community within the walls of that complex because it was so multinational and it was so big. So um, I think that was a very interesting model for artists of the world, you know, forming a family. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I really loved a little tiny residency that was close to my house that looked like a very broken down uh, old building, not comfortable at all. Um, but I also met uh, an artist in there who was so happy because their program was that they were very established in Berlin, part of the old punk scene, you know, been there since before the Berlin Wall, very part of the history and the fabric of the city. And what they would do for, they had very few residents and the residents had to pay and they had to do everything themselves for themselves, but what they did was they would find the resident, a partner, and they would offer partnerships from a journalist, a philosopher, a chef, a farmer, uh, an old age pensioner, a school teacher, whatever. They had an enormous range of very interesting correspondent partner companions that they would pair you with. Um, and that person would look off, would be your, your touch point. And the artist that I spoke to had um, connected with a philosopher um, and was having the most rich and peculiar experience of the city with this person. And it was delivering a really different experience to their art practice than they expected and that they had ever experienced. So it almost had nothing to do with uh, like the Batanian which was very much the art context, the, the top of the tree art context. This was completely and utterly different, but I, I find them both to be fantastic and, and the artists in both cases to be having a really extraordinary experience. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm. Beautiful stories. Thank you, mm. thank you. Uh, I believe that uh, among our audience, there are a lot of uh, aspiring artists who would like to join a residency program. Uh, would you two have some uh, um, uh, suggestions for uh, those who would like to consider to take a, a residency program? Uh, like how do I choose a residency program? Or uh, what should I prepare? Uh, how do I prepare myself for a residency program? Would you like to share? Okay, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, if um, i like to uh, 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 use a metaphor. I always think a uh, uh, resident uh, uh, residency program is sort of like uh, you can see that as as a vehicle, as a vehicle. Yeah. Uh, 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 some 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 artists may may need to take a taxi. Some would need to take a bus. Some need a private car, or some need a subway because they need to be there fast and uh, re reliable transportation. And it's very important if you are interested to join a residency, to really do the research and to understand what each residency program has there to offer. And uh, a lot of residency uh, uh, programs are doing very meaningful work. And uh, I am just like, I just now was just humbly, sh humbly sharing some of the experience we have uh, at the ACC. But I find that uh, uh, Res Artists is doing really great work because is such a, a, a resource of information, mm -hmm. which at the fingertips, where artists can learn, a, 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 a get a lot of information about the various residency program there to offer. And my advice is you really have to do your research and also know what you want mm -hmm. because you have to choose the right mode of transportation and taking you to the right destination yeah, 
if you are not looking, if you chose the wrong uh, a vehicle, it might take you to the wrong place and it's a waste of your time. Time is very precious. And, uh, and one way to do this is to be truthful when doing the application. Don't try to write things that you thought the funder, that appeal to the funder. Mm. Just be true to yourself. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's not a competition. It's actually a best match. Yeah. And uh, 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 for the uh, uh, funders, a lot of time or resi residency, they are trying to select the artist who could make the best use of the opportunity, not the best artist out of the pool. Yeah, I hope um, yeah, you will find this useful. Thank you, thank you. And Sophie, um, can you share? I have very little to add. That was very beautifully stated and thank you for recommending the network. I do think research is very important and that's why I think the re joining the network is useful because it gives you that opportunity to really uh, dig into the, those 500 plus residencies that are so different one from the other. And I think it gives you the opportunity to communicate uh, with the residencies, really to interview them um, as much as they will interview you to select whether they're the right fit. I think, I think the truthful is very important, being truthful uh, to yourself as well, because it can be lonely. It can be very challenging uh, sometimes you expect something and you receive something entirely different. And that can be, um, if, if you're not strong at that point in your, uh, in your well-being, but also in your career, that can be very destabilizing. And so it, it, it is important to feel in the right place uh, before going on a residency. Um, and I think sometimes my experience is that people do expect to be very looked after by the residency operator. And often those residency operators are, are tiny and ill-resourced and not, and perhaps overselling their ability to look after you. So if, if I were going for a residency, I would, and I wanted to be looked after, I'd be really asking my peers and asking my colleagues, are they really going to look after me? Trying to um, talk to people who have been there before. But also um, maybe uh, going, you know, if it's your first time, going closer to home, going to places where you know people like you have been before, maybe going for a sort of starter residency rather than the, the, the big once in a lifetime residency. Um, yeah, that would be some additional tips, I think. Mm, that's very true. Yeah, that's very true. Um, just like the story that Josephine has, has shared, like uh, Lin Wu or Xiu Hui, if they, they are not truthful to themselves, and they might not have that motivation and openness to explore what they, they uh, what the possibility they can experience during the residency. And I believe um, those of you who are now uh, joining us, or you know, uh, the, or the audience, you have a lot of questions that you would like to ask our speakers. Before I open to the floor uh, for Q&A session, may I uh, uh, ask uh, the two speakers, are there any uh, like upcoming residency opportunities that you'd like to recommend to our audience that they might want to pay attention to? Thank you. Uh, I will go first, Jessica, because my mind is very simple. We uh, invite application once every year. And because of COVID, it's sort of uh, 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 our cycle was affected. Usually we invite application for uh, during September and closes at the end of October. But right now we are sort of uh, 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 trying to monitor the situation on when international travel will resume before we decide to, uh, 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 when we will open the next round of application. But you are always welcome to check into the ACC website and we will try to post any update in our website. Yeah, for everybody information. Thank you, Josephine. Sophie? 
So on our website, on the Res Artists website, there is a section uh, entitled Open Calls, and there's quite a number posted on there. Um, those are available. You don't have to be a member to see those, um, but there's quite a number um, both in places where you can go in person, but also of these new model digital residencies. There's probably too many to, to list, and I don't know them well enough to pick out any in particular. But I would, there's definitely quite a bit still going on. It feels like even though the field has stumbled in the period of COVID and some places have had to cancel or postpone, many have now made that pivot to the digital or to the regional or to the local. And so there, there is uh, there's certainly plenty to look at. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. And thank you, Josephine. I believe we have warmed up enough <laughs> and our audience are ready to join our conversation here. And I see one question that's posted in the chat box. That is, uh, what do you think about online residency program? Uh, may, uh, either of you would like to respond to this question. What mm. do you think about online residency program? Mm. Um, for, for us, we, we, we always find that nothing can replace a lived experience in another culture. Yeah, but uh, for various reasons, like the, uh, 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 when it's not possible to fly or when you are living in a very remote place, I think virtual exchange is the best alternative. It's the best alternative. And, uh, and uh, but virtual exchange cannot exist alone. I think we need we need uh, 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 a lot of uh, uh, established relationships to make that really work. Yeah, uh, a comparison. I always I always think about uh, uh, a comparison to this is uh, we have been working from home. Yeah, for the last uh, uh, one 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 and a half years, and uh, the reason why. It works for us is because we already know our colleagues. We already uh, uh, built report, and there's a already a culture in that organization. That's why oh uh, uh, we found that oh work from home still works, and uh, it's only when I heard about stories or experience from uh, uh, new colleagues joining an organization that's really hard for them because there's no nothing for them to build on and it's sort of uh, mm, uh, 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 comparable to virtual and an in-person experience yeah that's what i find <laughs> thank you thank you how about sophie yes i agree i think the chance to experience a place uh through your body is very important um but it also is so important not to lose touch with other nations. For us in Australia, we are uh, an island and we need to be in touch with our friends from other places. And we certainly work very hard to make those connections. So many artists here invest so much of their personal time and resources in making international friendships that they have to rely on the digital. There is no alternative at present if they want to retain that momentum and to keep those bonds that are very important for their practice, but also for their sense of purpose and connection to the world. So it might not be ideal, but certainly for, for us here, it feels very urgent and we, uh, envy countries that have close neighbors where they can get on a train or um, cross a border in a day. Um, for us, it's always been hard and uh, to, to work internationally. And so maybe we're more uh, dogged and determined than some people who maybe feel a little more complacent and feel that they can let a year or two go and they can pick up but I think for Australians in particular, it feels really important to keep our connections alive uh, in both directions. And if digital is the only way, then we will do it digitally.
We've lost your sound, I'm afraid. How am I unmute on, guys? Uh, can you hear me? Sophie, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, the second question. Um, the second question is, do you have any advice to small grassroots organization that want to branch into hosting artists for mission-driven purposes? Mm, mm, mm. You hear the question clearly? Mm. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. yeah, would you like to share? Yeah, either of you? Mm. Uh, um, um, we don't have uh, 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 enough information to understand the background or resources that the your your organization or uh, uh, the grassroots organization have, but uh, uh, but I found that it's very important to be consistent on what you're doing. ACC, well, if you compare to other organization or like a, 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 a art. A, 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 international organization. We are not that big. And the, we only do one thing for the past 60 years and sending artists to uh, United States for cultural exchange. And in Hong Kong, we only do one thing is for the past 30 years, we sent, we've sent 300 Hong Kong artists to, to United States. But then, to, and every year it's only, we're talking about like uh, uh, less than 10 artists having this opportunity. But after 30 years, looking back, it, uh, the impact accumulate. Yeah, it built up. And, uh, and, uh, it, uh, and the, 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 the thing that, in the, and that an individual can do, the investment on an individual can be very big at the end of the day. And I think it's very important to be consistent on what you're doing. And another challenge that we are facing or other organizations, grassroots organizations are facing is sometimes we need to adapt to requests from funders or where the money, money is. And uh, there's a lot of temptation up there. Oh, it's easier to get funded if you're working on community projects, yeah, as opposed to uh, helping artists. Uh, 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 joining a recipe program, and you really have to believe what you're doing and to be persistent and to be very resourceful. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. And Sophie? Yes, I also think that's true. It, it is about integrity and uh, a clear purpose. I don't think it needs to be a big, glossy, shiny undertaking that Finnish residency that I mentioned ended up being artists inviting other artists to their home and uh, working in uh, uh, the education setting that they were working in. So it wasn't uh, making a piece in a theater or showing a thing in a festival. It was actually a very simple and basic connection. Um, that was very much within the resources that the artist had for themselves and only those. And then uh, the, under, the exchange was really the same on the other end. So they, they went to the Finnish artist's house and um, it was very modest and very humble and everybody wanted it to grow. So they did want to end up uh, working in a studio and making work to show to the audience in the other country but the understanding was to start that they would just start with what they already had which was their homes their their context of teaching um, and take it from there and I think sometimes people are intimidated to think that they have to offer a season or a, a, an opportunity that lives with an institution and, and that's not necessarily the case I think uh, residency exchange can start very small or residency hosting can start very modest and can grow um, from there. Mm, mm, thank you, thank you. So another question is, uh, could you talk about any interesting residency opportunities that you've heard about for ensembles or small groups, thinking dance or theater artists? 
I think uh, we need uh, uh, Sophie's help to answer this question. <laughs> I was just going to try and quickly look at the Res Artists website and see what is, uh, what is open at the moment. Um, oh gosh, it's a so hard one. Yeah. Yes, please, Sophie. Yeah. I noticed in the chat that Rosie Hind had posted the residencies in Japan. Um, mm. Thank you for that, Rosie. And there are many residencies that are targeted at groups. Um, mm. I think off the top of my head, I can't pull that out of my brain for res artist network but i know there are many um, and many are targeted at an individual and will expand to host a smaller group quite comfortably uh, if if that group can uh, work in a in the same space um, i'm thinking in in europe in particular there are many for dance there um, are a lot of dance companies that host residencies, but also um, some of those theaters that are in co-producing networks will build residencies into those arrangements because if they want to show work in their seasons and bring artists over, they know that they need to give them space and time to work in that place. So mm -hmm. any of those more established European uh, dance and theatre venues um, will definitely have residencies associated. The problem then is, however, that the one, the more prominent the residency, the more, the greater the competition. And I think that is particularly difficult for people who are not in established circuits, like co-producing circuits. Um, mm. If you're coming into a place for the first time, I always think it's better to start very small, start as an individual, do your research and maybe bring your ensemble or your group back the next time. Um, but to enter into a new place, it's often good to start um, as, with a light touch. I can see lots of people putting in uh, examples in the chat. So thank you everybody yeah. for helping me out. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, resources on the Res Artists web, web, website and also ACC Hong Kong's website. So maybe you can also check it out. And uh, the next question is, what are the most common challenges that the artists would face in the past experiences? And it relates to another question that is, what, what should I do when I found that I chose the wrong place for residency? So maybe uh, would, would the two of you give some, uh, some insight to these two questions? Uh, yeah, um, I will go first, Sophie. Um, the most common challenges, actually, we thought we are well traveled in this contemporary times, but it's very different if you're going for a vacation or if you're going to, uh, entering university overseas than going for a residency. Cultural shock does happen, it's real. Yeah, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and our, uh, we, we do, we do have a, 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 a past experience where artists have difficulty in trying to fit into the uh, New York, which is a very big city, which is very uh, uh, multicultural and uh, on the surface is very similar to Hong Kong, but it is not. Yeah. And I find this is the most common challenges. Yeah. And um, uh, what, what, uh, what to do if you found that you ended up in a wrong place? I think I'm gonna rephrase this question, uh, which is uh, what, this, what would be the suggestion if the resi residency does not match your expectation? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I have to tell you, uh, to be honest, yeah, 90% of ACC grantee, um, uh, their actual experience is different from what they put down in the application. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. And uh, in effect, there's no wrong place for residency. As an artist, you are creative. You should be very curious and open. If this doesn't work, if this door is, sh is shut, you should be able to find another way, yeah, to, to make that experience fulfilling. I think it's 
in it's upon you <laughs> how to make your residency experience uh, fruitful. I would add, I think sometimes people are very hard on themselves. I noticed when I would speak to artists on residencies, they would have come with an expectation that they would make a new work, they would integrate into the culture, they would meet all the important people, they would have a net friendship network, and you would say to them, it's, it's like you say, Josephine, it's fine if you just come and you go to Chinatown and you don't have to do all these things. It's not your once in a lifetime opportunity. I mean, maybe for some people it is. And, but it, I think even that weight of expectations then crushes any joy that you can get out of the opportunity. And, and people who are relaxed, I have a friend who's a, um, he's in his 80s and he continues to go on. He's a writer and he continues to go on residencies and he's the most relaxed about it. He will uh, spend the afternoon, you know, buying some socks or, you know, he really, he, he really enjoys being in the places he's in and he just takes it on its merits. If, if that's the only thing to do in Lithuania is to go to the market and buy some socks, then that's what he does. And he sort of makes an art experience out of that. Like you say, Josephine, I think it, it getting that, um, that pleasure and uh, connection to the place is yeah. um, it's the people who go and have a really big list of things that they need to achieve. And I think get very frustrated. It's very difficult in a short space of time to make an impact on a place personally mm -hmm. and for that mm -hmm. place to make a, a genuine impact on you and I think time is a real enemy in residencies people um, assume that they will do a lot of things in six months or three months or even a year goes very quickly and um, I think people who who um, put a great expectation on the on a on a short space of time they're the ones who really are most challenged yeah, that's true. I still remember when I was in New York doing my residency, I enjoyed mostly taking a walk at, in Central Park mm -hmm. <laughs> every day. Yeah. Yeah. And that helps me a lot as well, just thinking all the experiences that I had in a foreign land. So, so that's very, very true. And uh, I, uh, I can see that uh, there are lots of uh, audience would like to hear the second part of a Mui story. <laughs> uh, would Josephine please uh, oh. share with us? Oh. Oh, yeah, of course, my pleasure. And um, uh, uh, I was uh, uh, going through my, my notes. And uh, yeah, Siu Mui went to United States twice and then came back came back and did the awakening in the dream. And then uh, uh, by now, I think you, you understood that Simu is a very hardworking, diligent artist, always trying to learn new things and learn from the master. And then uh, and one day he, she found that she learned a lot, but then she was unable to digest what she has come across. It's like she was uh, 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 putting on layers of layers of clothes buried inside the, the clothes and feeling very bulky. So she's decided to go back to New York again. And this time she ran into a performance uh, about contact improvisation. And that gave him a lot of, uh, that created a huge impact on her. Uh, on her. And um, what she learned was um, as an artist, um, you need to embrace what you have. And you, it doesn't need to dance according to rules in a certain style. Yeah, at some point you have to forget your style and the body is actually like a mixer where you mix different things that you have absorbed, different culture. It's like a vessel to hold on, to, to, to hold your experience. And, uh, and, uh, and also that's when she started to dance with objects like the umbrella, mm -hmm. the umbrella, mm -hmm. yeah. To build a relationship with that object, yeah. And, uh, and that created a huge impact on her. And so when she came back to Hong Kong, Siung Mui created the Bowe eulogy. As Hong Kong audience, we know that that's another signature piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, uh, in our dance history and also in Siung Mui portfolio. 
Thank you, thank you. <laughs> you, you know, Josephine has a lot of uh, these uh, beautiful stories uh, with artists. And uh, Sophie, uh, would you, uh, do, uh, would that remind you of uh, any uh, similar stories that you've encountered? Uh, like the second part of stories that you'd like to share with us? <laughs> Well, no, I can't match Josephine's stories. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> <She's> so <laughs> Actually, Sophie, um, I have 10 stories in my pocket. <laughs> I know. I work at ACC I for 10 years. I have 10 stories, so every time I will pull out one story. <laughs> I'm listening and learning from you, Josephine, webinar expert. <laughs> I can see there's a, a news question. Um, oh, that's um, okay. That might relate to uh, what we've discussed, uh, like about um, maybe some wrong matches. Uh, so this question is about, I heard some artists might experience some kind of depression after returning to the countries, you know, after we're in a heaven and then we go back to reality to our home countries and they might experience some kind of depression. I'm not sure what that means, but maybe you have uh, more to share. Can both of you share your view or any suggestion uh, to those artists who, who are preparing to take on their residency? Yeah. He, he, uh, uh, this is a very good question because this is also very true. Yes. Yeah, in the history of ACC, we do have uh, our grantees who return to the home. Uh, first of all, most of the grantee would return to the home country, mm -hmm. to the original uh, 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 places. And we do have some isolated, isolated cases where uh, 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 the artists, yeah, really uh, 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 experience depression going home. And uh, we try to keep in touch with them as ACC. We, we always tell them that our relationship did not end after you go back home. And we are a big family. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. we will be with you until the end of time. <laughs> we are there. We are there. And every time we see our previous grantee, it's like, just like a homecoming. Yeah, the relationship is still there. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and uh, and uh, and the other thing is, uh, yes, sometimes when you go back home, the most common uh, problem that we heard from them is, well, it was so nice during the past six, six months. Mm -hmm. But then when you go home, everything is the same. The problem is still there. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, uh, I'll, uh, all we can say is these are facts of life. Yeah. And uh, as an artist, yeah, we have, we will, we will be able to, to have this positive spirit. And, uh, and that's what art is, is there for, is for us to uh, 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 be able to create a better future, both for yourself and for everybody. Mm. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Just bring me. hope, bring hope, art brings hope, yeah. Thank you. Sophie? I think we don't think about coming back from a residency very much. And I think it's a really good question, actually. Um, I, I certainly, when I was based overseas and looking, working with people coming to Berlin or to Brussels on their residencies, I didn't speak to them about what it would be like going back. And I, I actually think that residency operators move on to the next person coming in. And there probably isn't enough of what you described, Josephine, that care and, and continuity. Um, it's really um, an interesting area, probably needs some thought from people who fund residencies, uh, those national networks. I know that artists support each other well, and certainly um, I know that people who've been on the same residency from a country will stay in touch and that's, Maybe a good tip is to find your alumni from the residency. So if you can't be there anymore in that lovely temporary family that you made, maybe there's um, people who have also left and want to stay in touch. And sometimes residencies, the really good ones, do run uh, social media and um, ways of staying in touch with alumni. So I think maybe uh, when you come back and you miss that residency or you miss the experience, maybe you should take it upon yourself to find other people like you who've been ejected and, and connect. Because I do think 
um, there's a special bond that happens to people on their residency together, but also people who've been to the same place. And especially if that's a, a far away place and a place where you want to maintain connections. And certainly again, for us in Australia, I think we underestimate how much artists have to uh, contribute as a rule in society here. We, we don't give artists their due respect and agency in our society. And I think artists who've been overseas and have a great deal of learning and intercultural experience and richness to share, come back and find that nobody wants to talk to them about it. And there's nowhere for them to deposit this richness and nowhere to share it. And that is a real oversight. Um, I know personally so many artists who have so much intercultural where they should be running the country. You know, they know so much about Indonesia or our near neighbors. They should be running our foreign policy and our education <laughs> and our economy. And, um, and it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real problem that we don't value that and take the, you know, take the benefit of that in back into our society. So it's a fantastic question. Yeah, that's true. That's so true. So uh, I I am aware that we are uh, running out of time. Uh, but before we end this session, uh, may I invite two speakers um, to uh, give the end uh, the last note on today's topic: new models on international residency. Mm. What do you think about the new models in the future? We talk about digital residency. We talk about a lot of online possibilities, but is that what we mean by new models? Would you please? Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, um, I think uh, uh, there should be many, many models for residency. Yeah. Uh, each type of residency has its own merit. And uh, and artists needs are uh, very diversified. We need different models so that it will match the different artists' need. And uh, at the end of the day, I think residency is more than a physical location. Yeah, yeah. the program and the experience is so much more uh, important than a physical location. And by extension, I agree with Sophie's view that there's a, a merit to develop more virtual residency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. if, if we could find a way to provide a uh, engaging, uh, uh, engaging experience for the participants of the residency program or the virtual program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And Sophie? And I, I think there's a lot uh, to be done in residencies now that we, now that international touring, for example, is so difficult. I think yeah. the opportunity and the, the impact, the environmental impact of flying into a place and flying out again is no longer something we can permit. So that the importance of being in a place for longer, making a contribution, making a connection between communities has so much more uh, value and importance to us now. So I think residency is actually um, our solution to many of the the problems that we have around irresponsible international exchange. Um, mm. And I think the fact that we've broken down some of the barriers to entry for different kinds of people is really positive. And also that we've somehow um, also broken down a little bit of the sense of um, uh, the need to be very well resourced. I think the digital residency that can be done just like this over free technology means that any, anybody can do it. Of course, they need um, the confidence, they need the connections, they need the networks. And, you know, that's where some of these artist to artist uh, projects okay. um, can, can build and can expand and can bring more people into the conversation. So I think that's a whole new era of the smaller, the longer, the humbler, the, the more um, quiet and connected, the patient residency um, to come. I'm, I'm excited to see what happens. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I believe that as artists, we can create new models with our creative mind. And I look forward to that. <laughs>
Yeah. Thank you so much. And thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Josephine, for all the sharing. Very, very inspiring and heartwarming. And uh, we hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as we do. And after leaving the talk, uh, uh, we will send you the post-event survey. And please take a few minutes to write us some feedback on this uh, conversation. Event Thai Conversation Series have another two talks and two workshops coming up between September and November. Please stay tuned and we hope to see you again. Thank you again, Sophie and Josephine, and good night. Thank you very much. <laughs>